At least he should, he does. But how do you really know somebody? Um, by spending time together, you know, stalking someone on social media does not count as knowing them. <laughs> Although, that's awkward, isn't it? When you go speak to someone who you really don't know, but you know a lot about them because they post a lot about themselves. Do you say, yeah, do you admit that you know this or do you just pretend like you don't know what's going on in their life? It's awkward, right? But how do you know somebody? Not by reading their autobiography or watching their TV show or hearing about them on the news. When you know somebody, it's because you spend time together and time being vulnerable together. And that's what we want to do as we look at Jesus these next seven weeks. We want to get to know him. And not just here on Sunday mornings, but throughout the week as well. But we want to start with some historical context. So I want to invite you to open your Bibles to Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3 in the Old Testament, near the front of your Bible. Because we want to reference here the first I am, the first statement of God declaring himself as I am. So here in chapter 3, to set the scene, you have got Moses, pretty big biblical figure historically here, coming to meet, finding himself in a location where there is a burning bush, a bush that is not being consumed by fire, but a bush that is lit up. And what happens when he's standing there, but he encounters God? So in chapter 3, let's pick this up in verse 10. So now, go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you, and this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you've brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God says to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. I am who I am. This is Yahweh. I am means this. It means I cause to be what is. I am is the creator, the origin of creation. And this moment here with God and Moses, God is naming himself. He's revealing himself and making himself known. What's the first step to knowing someone? Well, knowing their name. <laughs> God is expressing himself as the one and only God, the one who has been, the one who is, and the one who will be. This is a powerful moment between Moses and God and, and for humanity, where God introduces himself. He says, I am who I am. And with this knowledge of, of who God is, that the Old Testament, this Old Testament knowledge that God is, I am, it's important as we study through this series in the book of John, as we study these I am statements of Jesus. Because here in the Old Testament, God the Father revealed himself to Moses in that remote place in the burning bush. And in the New Testament, God is revealing himself through the very life of Jesus. It's not simply God naming himself, but revealing himself. And I love this concept, this idea of God becoming present. What does it mean to be present but to be with you in person? And these Seven vivid sayings that we heard in our call to worship, these I am statements of Jesus in the book of John, they reveal the presence 
of God, his incarnation, this idea of God coming to earth as a human so that we can be connected to him, that we could be reconciled to God. So each week, as we look at these different I am statements of Jesus, we want you to keep in mind the root of the I am. I am who I am. That is God himself. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we love you. And we give you praise today, for you are good. You are gracious. Lord, you are holy. I pray that as we consider your word, that it would penetrate our hearts and we would understand your love a little bit more. We would understand your character a little bit more, Lord, so that it would give glory to you. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. All right, now let's turn to John chapter six. John chapter six. Now I was going to, you know, as illustrations, I was gonna have some fresh bread cooking in here for you. That would be torture though, wouldn't it? Yeah, <laughs> when you're this close to the noon hour. And then I was like, oh, I could bring in a toaster, toast some bread, but burnt toast is kind of the worst smell, isn't it? And I don't wanna mess up your, you know, your tummy grumblings. So John chapter six. Now we wanna keep in mind in, in this scripture what's already happened. Uh, just before here at the beginning of chapter six, Jesus had performed one of probably his most famous miracles of feeding at least 5,000. There's more likely more. In the story it says there were 5,000 men. 5,000 people who had followed him out while he was teaching with five uh, loaves of barley bread and two fish. Very familiar story. So this has just happened. Not to mention many other miracles, uh, the changing the water into wine, some healings had taken place. So already Jesus is, is having this reputation for miracles and literally thousands of people were seeking him to know more about this miracle working rabbi. And that's where we are, where we pick up our scripture in chapter six, verse 26. We're gonna start with this first section here. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. You are looking for me, not because you saw miraculous signs, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. On him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then they asked him, what must we do to do the work, works God requires? Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So they asked him, what miraculous sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you. What will you do? Our forefathers ate the manna in the desert as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. First, we want to think about the situation as the people gather around him. The people that were coming to Jesus, I dare say they came with a questionable motive. They came expecting free food. <laughs> Raise your hand if you've ever come to something for free food. <laughs> Guilty. <laughs> They came expecting free food or, or a miracle, something to impress them. In fact, I think they approached Jesus with entitlement. And then when they hear Jesus say in verse 27, did not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to internal life, they immediately respond with the question, well, what work do we need to do to get this kind of food? They're getting excited about the temporal they're literally thinking with their stomachs, their physical need to be satisfied. And for me, just, just stepping into this scripture, 
it really, it makes me question my own approach to Jesus. How do we approach Jesus? Do we come with, with expectations, expecting stuff or miracles, or with the expectation of what we think we should do and how God should act that out in our lives? Our world, especially in, in our Western culture, it seems obsessed with pleasing self. I mean, how often um, have you or I or others around us, have, how often have we been motivated with this concept of what's in it for me? Friends, what's in it for me is, is not how Jesus thinks. It's not how Jesus functions. If you're familiar with Philippians 2, it's this beautiful chapter talking about Jesus and his humility, how he's constantly putting others' interests before his own. What's in it for me is not the right approach to the king of kings that I am. And here we have in this story, despite their approach with an expectation to be impressed, Jesus replies so graciously, as he always does. And he says, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. He says, you want the food that endures? All you need to do is believe. And instead of receiving this grace, the, the clear message to believe, what do the people say to Jesus? Prove it. <laughs> Show me a miracle. What miracle are you going to do? Our ancestors had manna falling from the sky. And here in this moment, Jesus begins to unwrap this, this mystery of, of his incarnation, the action of him coming down to the, to the earth. He begins to reveal and to explain his part of the redemption plan for humanity. And let's see what he says. We're going to start in verse 32. Chapter 6. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth. It is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, from now on, give us this bread. And then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you've seen me, and still you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all that he has given me, but raise them up at that last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise up at the last day. At this, the Jews began to grumble about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I came down from heaven? Stop grumbling among yourselves, Jesus answered. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, they will all be taught by God. Everyone who listens to the Father and learns from him comes to me. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Only he has seen the Father. I tell you the truth, he who believes has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your forefathers ate the manna in the desert, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which a man may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. 
If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. This bread is my flesh, and listen to these next few words, which I will give for the life of the world. This is so important. Jesus here early in his ministry is already giving us a hint of what is to come. That he will literally give his body as an ultimate sacrifice for the glory of God and for the reconciliation of man to God. He's revealing here a key part of his character. This is getting to know Jesus. He says this, bread is my flesh, flesh which I will give for the life of the world. Jesus is revealing here a little bit. He's revealing his humility, his willingness to submit to the Father's will. Look back at verse 38. He says, for I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. Jesus was all about submission to the Father. And when I dare to compare the rest of us to Jesus, I can't help but think that where, where Jesus is obsessed with submitting to the Father, that the rest of us are just obsessed with consuming. Consuming stuff and experiences and accomplishments and relationships and knowledge. Our society is, is all about consuming. And as far as I can tell in our Western culture, we're driven by these two trains of thought. The first one is, um, I will be happy when. Oh, I'll be happy when I get a boyfriend. I'll be happy when I get a husband. I'll be happy when I get that job I've always heard. I'll be happy when I finish my education. I'll be happy when my children are perfect and obey every single word I say. <laughs> Did that slip? That was a little, a little too much? Yeah. That's not reality. And then you've got this second statement that I think really drives our culture, and it's this, I'll satisfy myself with, fill in the blank. People. My job, my accomplishments, money, stuff. And here's the deal. These two fill in the blanks always end up the same. They end up with perpetual discontentment. You will never be satisfied. There'll always be another thing, another goal. There'll always be something else that you'll try to satisfy. As long as we keep pursuing stuff or people or knowledge to satisfy our lives, we will be starving for fulfillment. Jesus is the bread of life. He sustains us, he strengthens us, he provides for us with the Holy Spirit in the most inner part of our heart and soul. I'm wondering if each of you, if you want to be more like the world, consuming whatever comes your way, or do you want to be like Jesus and submit to the Father? Let's look at verse 52. Then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day, for my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. 
just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your forefathers ate manna and died, but he who feeds on this bread will live forever. He said this while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. Okay, let's just say this. Jesus just got weird, <laughs> right? When you read those verses, are you like, hmm, this is a little weird. Yes, it is, it's real weird. And by the sheer humanity of the crowd that's around him, they easily got weirded out as well. And they asked the question, which is noted in verse 52, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? It's gross. This is one of those passages in the Bible that is often listed in hard sayings of Jesus, or maybe one that doesn't even make sense to many, or one that is often skipped over. Um, but in these few verses, Jesus is, is just, he's trying to, to truly help us understand the extent to which we need him. First, let me say it, even though it should be obvious, this is not about cannibalism. <laughs> Nobody's eating anybody else's body here, okay? We're not eating, taking a chunk out of Jesus' hand. This is not Walking Dead episode, okay? This is Jesus making the argument in this text. He's making the argument for the, the nutrition of a person's soul. Now, I know enough about tradi tradition and nutrition to know uh, what I need to help make my physical body function. Furthermore, I know what food and drink is good for me and what food and drink is bad for me. That bowl of ice cream at 10 o'clock last night was probably not a good decision. <laughs> We have so much information about how to take care of our bodies. You know, what food is good? A lot of people argue that bread is bad for you, which that was not the case in uh, Jesus' time. Bread was your staple in your diet. And we all make cho choices every day, right, about how to fuel our bodies, about how to care for our physical bodies. And here's the deal, we reap the benefits or we reap the consequences of what we put in our bodies. And what Jesus is trying to convey here in John 6 is that he is the only thing, he is the only thing that will satisfy your soul. And the reason he, he's, He's using such a, a deliberately shocking and disturbing illustration is because he's trying to get the crowd to understand how vital he is as a member of the triune Godhead, how vital he is to, to the nutrition of their very souls. It says this, look at verse 53. Very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. What do food and drink do for our bodies? It gives us strength, it helps us grow, it contributes to our health, it gives us energy. It gives our physical body life. Or, frankly, depending on what you put in it, death. And friends, what does the flesh and blood of Jesus Christ do for our souls. It gives us life. His crucified flesh was the redeeming sacrifice that paid for our sins. His surrendered blood is the cleansing balm to a world full of broken sinners. How do we experience true, abundant life in this world? We let Jesus Christ himself, through the Holy Spirit, Spirit, permeate every single square inch of our mind, body, and soul. 
that's what happens when, when you ingest physical food. It's digested and the nutrients are shared throughout the rest of the body. I have very bad science <laughs> experience. But I know when you eat, it's fuel. Jesus is the spiritual food that will nourish your soul. So go ahead and embrace the weirdness here. If you want to take your spiritual life beyond belief, beyond simply believing in Jesus Christ as Lord, if you want to experience true transformation, if you want to know Jesus, to really know him intimately, his character, his broken heart, his graciousness, if you want life, then partake of the bread of Jesus. What in the world are we waiting for? If you are a believer that only gets fed by the word of God once a week on a Sunday morning, then you are spiritually starving. John 1, verses 1 through 4 says this, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life. Friends, Jesus is life. Do you know him? Have you ingested his word himself? Why? So that you can get your soul healthy. Matthew 4, 4 says, this is Jesus, he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Let me tell you, today and every day, the word of God will sustain you. Jesus, the bread of life, is all that you need. Maybe some of us have been trying to satisfy our hunger for life by, by filling your heart or your soul with other things, with relationships, the pursuit of money, work, ambition, addiction, food, family. Not all things are bad, but when they replace Jesus as your obsession and your pursuit, they will not give you life. In fact, they'll sap you of energy and purpose and meaning because all of those things are temporal. You need to know that nothing from this world will satisfy your nutritional need for Jesus Christ. Now you can try, but you will never be satisfied. You will never be full. You will never know life without abiding with the Lord, letting him come into every part of your soul with his Holy Spirit. I'm going to ask Rochelle to come to the piano. I have to apologize because I, I changed our last song right before I got up here. But the song that the, the songsters shared with us is so appropriate for us today. It's this picture of a deer panting for the water, desperate for a drink. And like that, our soul is desperate to be fed Yes, by the flesh and blood of Jesus Christ. To be forgiven, to be redeemed, to be filled with the Spirit so that we can serve. 
And it lends me to ask you a couple questions this morning. First, when you think about that first portion of scripture that we looked at, how do you approach Jesus? Are you coming to him with expectations of temporal, worldly satisfaction? That is wrong. Jesus does not call us to be happy. He calls us to be holy. That means there are days you might be wanting. You might be struggling. But do you know who satisfies you in those circumstances and those situations that are difficult? Jesus Christ himself will keep your heart satisfied. So how do you approach Jesus? And second, are you nourished by the bread of life or are you hungry? <laughs> if you're not receiving regular time in the word of God and you're not hungry, your prayer should be to be hungry for God, to be hungry for his word. I'm no good on one meal a day. Five minutes in the morning does me no good for the rest of the day. Practicing the presence of God in our living, in our working, in our doing, in our sharing life together. It's a discipline to invite the Lord into everything that we do. So are you nourished by the bread of life? You know, Here's a bit of a confession. I really love junk food. I do. Chips, candy, chocolate, ice cream, all of it. I really have not met a junk food I don't like. Well, maybe those really hot chips. You know what I'm talking about? Those are a little too much. But I love junk food. But here's the thing. Do you know what junk food equates to in this soul situation? The junk food is, it's the world's expectations of, of consuming and using. That is junk. That will not fill you up and that will not satisfy. You're just going to keep going back for more. It's like an addictive circle. That is what the world has to offer, junk that will destroy your body. What the Lord offers is whole and pure and healthy and regular fellowship with the Lord and submission to God. That is the clean eating, the healthy soul diet that we need to be desperate for. Friends, if you're pursuing the world, you will be continuously discontent and discouraged. I want to encourage you this morning to partake of the bread of life. Jesus himself, who will inspire and motivate and cleanse and change you from the inside in. We're gonna sing this song a few times through and if you'd like to come and pray at the altars, I invite you to seek the Father, to commit to the bread of life, to submit to our creator in every part of your life. Let's sing together. Close your eyes. Do a quick priority check here of your own heart, of your own life. What consumes you? What are you constantly thinking about or worried about or pursuing 
maybe at the expense of a relationship with Christ or, or of the fellowship of believers. What has become an idol in your life so much so that you choose it over the bread of life? Right now I invite you to pray and to ask the Lord to take it. To help you fall into his rhythm of grace that will sustain you. To take away the, the hunger for the world. Pray for release. For freedom from the bondage. Heavenly Father, we come to you and we pray that your Holy Spirit would challenge us and convict us in our hearts where we have sinned against you by choosing things of this world over you. Help us to understand and to know that only you can satisfy. Lord, that you are all that we need. Lord, we confess that we are weak. We confess, Lord, that we are sinners. And we pray that when we are tempted to pursue anything of this world, we pray that your spirit would move into our heart and move into our mind and give us strength and power to choose you. You are satisfying. You fill us. Thank you, Lord, for your grace, for your love. Father, I pray that your spirit would be mighty in us and that you would use us for your glory. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. I invite you to stand, and as our benediction today, let's sing this song together once more.